I am on my way to uh, shoot video for a project that I am doing and I just wanted to add this as part of the journey. I am in the car. I'm nervous. Um, I don't I don't know what to expect um, but I do want to share my story. Um, I don't know how it's going to end but I do know how it's going to begin or how it began. It began with me uh, owning my story, owning a portion of my life that um, I just didn't deal with. And so I'm ready, or at least I think I am. I'm as ready as I'm going to be. Um, and I just wanted to share it with you. And I hope that it benefits and blesses somebody and heals somebody and causes somebody to walk in a greater sense of purpose and a higher level of authenticity um, and gives you the courage just to be you and share whatever story it is. Hi, my name is Michelle Rouche, and I want to share a part of my story that um, I didn't know was hidden, uh, but when I discovered it, it opened, I guess they say Pandora's box uh, of emotions. And so I, I really didn't know what to do with it, so I sat on it for a bit, and um, it was, I think, a little bit more than I had signed up for. Um, just trying to process those things and those feelings that came flooding back when I was asked a simple question. Um, I was doing a radio interview, and the person that was interviewing me asked me, have you ever had any childhood trauma? And so my immediate response was, no. Um, I'm a, I come from a two-parent household. Uh, my parents were loving. Uh, we were never homeless. We were never hungry. And so that was my uh, canned definition, or I guess perspective, on trauma. And then something happened. Uh, I got back to my car and I thought about the question again and kind of rehearsed it in my mind. And all of a sudden it hit me. Um, it, was, it was at that moment in my car that I realized that I never owned my childhood trauma. I never identify my childhood trauma. And when you hear the word childhood, you're thinking of a little kid, but my childhood trauma was at the age of 16. Um, I became pregnant at the age of 16 and I didn't realize until she asked me that question. So, so many of my experiences, emotions, feelings, uh, even memories, um, were just suppressed, um, hidden, um, maybe even forgotten. I think forgotten is probably the best word to describe it. It was, it was forgotten. And I sat in my car um, just trying to come to terms with what was like revelation to me. It was brand new, um, something that happened to me so many years ago now I was confronting it and um, just coming to terms with reconciling my own feelings. And so I sat in my car, I cried, um, I thought about some stuff and um, just kind of put it on pause again because it was almost an awakening um, to my life that I had carefully tucked away for so long. And now here I was sitting in my car with tears in my eyes, trying to figure out what do I do with these emotions? And so 
I decided I wanted to film it. Well, that decision came after, you know, I spoke with my daughter, I spoke with my husband, and um, I just wanted to do more than just feel those feelings. I wanted to document it. I wanted, I guess, this to legitimize my life in 1985, a lot of my life that I forgot, I put away, um, and the layers just started peeling back on what I felt, what I experienced, what I had forgotten, what I never processed, and what I just never allowed my 16-year-old self to feel. And here I was, 53, now feeling all the feelings. Um, it, was, it was hard. It wasn't comfortable. It was exhausting at some point. <laughs> um, I remember days where I just, I would just find myself weeping because um, I was finally feeling what I never allowed myself to feel. So as I unpack the story, I hope I don't jump around too much, but there are things that I want to share and things that I want to share with you. Um, the experience that I had. Um, we talk about uh, teen pregnancy and there were, no, there were no wonderful, cool MTV shows when I was 16 and pregnant. There was no 16 and pregnant. There were no cameras following me, uh, no way to make an income as a teen mom. Uh, that was, that, you know, seemed to be glamorous, I guess, on camera. So this is my story. This is my 16 and pregnant story, 30-something <laughs> years later. So I met this young man um, back, I'm, I'm from Savannah, so back then it was really popular to go to arcades. Uh, so I met him, my initial meeting was at the arcade, and he walks over and asked me my name, and then he asked me how old I was, and I, I was either 14 or 15, and his immediate response was, oh no, you're too young. <laughs> so this guy was really popular in Savannah. Um, so that was, our, that was our first meeting, our first encounter. And so I would see him around places that, you know, we hung out, uh, skating rink, the arcade, those things. So I, I did meet him again, and we, I guess, ex exchanged numbers. I don't know how that came to play, but I became his girlfriend. And um, at the time, I was 16, so some time had passed from our initial meeting. Um, he was five years older than me. So that would make him, what, 21? If my math is right, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Yeah, so he was an adult. Um, but we started a relationship and uh, the time came for him to meet my parents. And I'll never forget our, our initial meeting. Um, we sat in the living room, we're talking to my parents and my dad asked him what he wanted to do or be. And he said, <laughs> and he, said he wanted to be a professional football player. <laughs> and now that I think of it, it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> um, but then there came the question uh, about his age. And that's when it got serious. It, was, it wasn't hilarious at that point. Um, my mom immediately, uh, told me I was, you know, you can't see him. He's, he's a man. He's older. Um, but at that, that, at that point, I was invested in the relationship. And so we continued to see each other, kind of sneak around, sneaking and dating. And his clever idea, and I know a lot of people hear when somebody gets pregnant when they're a teenager, it was an accident. But mine wasn't an accident. His clever idea was that we should have a baby so that we could be together. And being 16 years old, I thought this was a great idea. We could be a family. <sighs> wow. <laughs> so that's what happened. That's what happened. 
The first person I told I was pregnant was my friend Teresa. And she lived in Charleston at one time. My family lived in Charleston and I called her and told her. Um, I don't even remember what her reaction was. I, I literally, I don't know what I was feeling. I don't know what I was processing. I just knew I was having a baby and that um, now my family would you know, have to accept him and have to accept the baby and we'd be family. Um, and so I told her, and I, I don't remember how, how I told my mom. Some of the things I literally don't, I can't recall. So I don't remember how I told her, but I do remember her reaction. I, I, I can still feel it. Um, I know she was hurt. I know my parents were hurt. Um, I know that they were disappointed. And my mom, her, uh, her solution to the problem was for me to have an abortion. And so that, that became an option that was on the table. Now I'm, I'm dealing with, or, or not, and I, I lose the, use the term loosely that I'm dealing with because I'm not actually dealing with it, it's just happening to me. So I go from being, telling my parents I'm pregnant and thinking that this is a solution for me and my boyfriend at the time, to my mom telling me that we're gonna fix this and um, ab abortion was my only option. And um, there, was, there was some rough times at our house. Um, like I said, I. I come from a two-parent home. My parents loved me. Um, we had a great relationship. I had two sisters. Um, and I don't, again, I, I'll keep, I probably sound like a broken record. There's so many things that I don't remember. Um, I don't remember how I shared it with my sisters. I don't remember if I shared it with my sisters or if my, my parents shared it with them. I, I just, I don't remember. But um, I'll fast forward to the part where my mom makes the appointment for me to have the abortion. And I knew that that's not what I wanted to do. I had spoken to, his name is Bosco, let's give him a name. <laughs> his name is Bosco, I had spoken to him and that was not our plan. I didn't want to do it, but not because he didn't want to do it. I, I didn't want to do it. I thought there was something wrong with him. And at the time, the abortion clinic was uh, on 34th Street in Savannah. And there was always, I remember passing by at different times, and there was always a lot of people outside protesting and uh, the anti-abortionist. And just, I never dreamed that I would have to walk through those people and hear those things, and I be the person that they were screaming these things to. So. I, I remember the day of the appointment. Um, I went. I remember the building. I remember the, you know, the, the street and just, I don't remember the drive, of that, none of that. Um, but I remember being there and I remember uh, them showing me pictures and then you had to watch this little movie that shows the abortion process. And after watching it, um, I was scared. I think this was the first time that I can identify the emotion that I was scared. I wasn't scared that I was pregnant. I wasn't scared that I was 16, but I was scared that uh, this procedure, um, this radical procedure, um, I was being forced into it. Now, my mom, she absolutely loved me, but I understand now because we've had conversations, I understand now that uh, my story was her story. She was a 16 year old pregnant teenager and her solution was to get married. <laughs> so my mom and dad, got, my mom got married when she was 16 and my dad was 18 and that was her solution. And later, you know, when I'm sharing my story with her, she's you know, telling us things, me and my sisters, um, telling us her, her story. So here I am at the abortion clinic and I've looked, I've looked at the video and the, the, one of the ladies comes in and she tells me, she said, um, 
that I had to give consent. And so, she said it was my decision. And at that moment, it was, it was as if I had the control back. She said I had to give consent and it was my decision. And so I told her I didn't want to do it and I shared with her why I was there that my mom, you know, bought me. And she said, well, you don't have to. And so I did it. And so I walked out and back into the waiting room where, where my mom was. And um, again, I don't remember what happened. I just told her I didn't want to do it. And she was at that point, her disappointment turned into anger. She was really angry and um because she thought that, you know, she had found a solution that would help my life. And I decided I didn't want to go with her solution. Um, so she told me I couldn't live at our house anymore. Woo. So she told me I couldn't live at our house anymore. I don't remember her and my dad having the conversation. I just remember her making a declaration that um, I could no longer live at our house. And so I'm thinking, where am I going? Um, I think at the time, Bosco lived with his aunt or grandmother or whatever. And I know I didn't want to live with them. Um, and so I, I moved in with my mom's sister. And at the time, she was pregnant, too. And... It wasn't until a couple months ago when we were all together um, at, at my home um, that my sisters, we started talking about this and I don't remember how I got to my aunt's house or uh, did I pack, I don't remember the packing, the leaving, I just know that I lived with her. And a, a big part of me sitting here is so that I can communicate um, to families, to teen mothers, to moms, how crucial certain times in a daughter's life where she, no matter how hard it is, she absolutely needs the support of her mom, um, the support of her family. And so, again, I knew my mom loved me, but this was, I, she didn't wanna relive this. And it was okay, it was okay. Um, we did the best we could and my sister shared with me that um, I ran away from home. <laughs> um, they said I left a note, I left a note and I was gone the next morning. I have no recollection of that. zero memories of me leaving. I don't know. I don't remember the note. Um, I w it wasn't until they told me that, um, <laughs> that I actually figured out how I left, the transition of me leaving my house and, and, and arriving at my aunt's house. Keep in mind, I'm still going to school every day. <laughs> I'm still maintaining my grades. Still being an 11th grader, a pregnant 11th grader. <laughs> I remember um, some of the things during those times, I just didn't feel like a person. Nobody was acknowledging me and the elephant that was obviously in the room. And I, I just remember going to school and only one of my teachers actually acknowledging the fact 
um, that one of their students was now having a baby and his name was Mr. Jackson. And I will never forget him because he made me feel human. He said, um, he looked at me, he said, he called me Hall. He called everybody by their last name. And Hall at, the, at that time was my, was my last name. He said, Hall, I want you to finish school. He didn't say anything that was, you know, heartwarming or anything, but that meant the world to me that he was personally invested in me to the point where he had to say that. He said, I want you to finish school. Finishing school was never an option for me. I always knew that I wanted to finish school. I mean, I loved school, um, made good grades. Um, and so, I went to school every day. Um, as my belly grew, um, I had to wear some maternity clothes. <laughs> that was weird. Um, the only outfit that I remember, the only outfit I remember that I absolutely hate, well, no, I remember two outfits. I had some blue maternity pants and this blue and white striped uh, maternity top. And it was hideous. It looked like old lady clothes. And I absolutely hated it. And I had one other dress. It was a pleated dress and it was also blue. Maybe blue was my favorite color then. I don't know. <laughs> but I remember those two ugly maternity outfits because I was huge. Um, but I have, when I realized I have no pictures, no physical evidence <laughs> of my pregnancy. I've asked my friends in high school if they have pictures of me. Um, nobody has pictures of me. There's no evidence. Well, the, my kids the evidence, but there's no evidence. So what should have been a really happy time, me being a teenager, um, was shrouded in shame. And what I didn't know at the time was that it was shame. And so that's why I'm crying because I didn't cry these tears decades ago. Uh, so we went to school. I went to school. I remember um, I would walk to school some of the times and then Bosco would take me to school. He had this this famous car. It was famous to Savannah. It was a black and white Granada. And that car took me to doctor's appointments and he would take me to school. And um, we were very much in a relationship. Uh, wow. And at the time, I, um, my high school didn't have air. So I was pregnant in the summer. My high school didn't have air, it was three floors. So I would be going up and down the stairs hot. <laughs> um, just still carrying on as a normal uh, junior in high school, um, plus baby in tow. Uh, so I moved to my aunt's house. And that was probably one of the hardest things, being away from my family, being away from my sisters, just the routine of getting up and getting dressed for school together and things that sisters do. And my aunt was kind enough and gracious enough to let me stay with her and she was pregnant at the same time. And I don't remember much about her house. I don't remember if I had a room. Yikes. I don't, I don't even remember if I had a bedroom. But I, I do remember one of the things that would constantly remind me that I was no longer home and that would remind me that my situation has placed me there. The place where she lived, it had mice. <laughs> and at night you could hear them. And back then in the 80s, they had rat traps. <laughs> uh, 
My grandma had rat traps at her house. It was just, and I would hear every now and then the trap snap. And there would be somewhat of a relief knowing that that thing, that thing that was scary to me was no longer a threat. And that would just, that would remind me that I wasn't home in the comfort of my home with my parents and my family. It wasn't because their house wasn't clean. <laughs> it was just where we lived. <laughs> I'm forever in her debt for just taking me in because I realized that I was, I was 16, so Somebody had to be responsible for my food. Somebody had to be responsible for making sure I was okay. And so I'm, I'm so, I'm grateful to her for allowing that space in my life uh, to be spent with her. At some point I transitioned from my aunt's house uh, back home. I don't know if it was right before, it had to be right before I had the baby because I have this distinct memory. I was, uh, I was at home and I was there with Bosco. We, it, it was close to time when I was supposed to have the baby. I don't know if it was a weekday. I don't know what. She was born on uh, January 14th. And so I remember feeling water coming down, <laughs> down my legs. Again, I'm 16. I know nothing about the birth process. Um, I, I don't, I don't know any of that. I didn't know any of that stuff. So I thought I peed myself, of course. And so I realized that it wasn't pee, that the water just kept coming. And I was like, oh, <laughs> my water broke. <laughs> And so I called my mom and we went to the hospital and there began the process of uh, me giving birth. I, I do remember it hurting. Um, back then, this was over 30 years ago, 1986. Back then, you know, they didn't have these lovely birthing rooms and uh, all, this, all the wonderful niceties that they have now. Um, I was again 16 and I remember being rolled into the delivery room and it was a huge room, kind of like where we are now. It was a huge room that was separated. Nothing separated you but a curtain from the next lady who was next to me screaming, um, giving birth. And so um, there was no epidural. I didn't even know about an epidural. Again, I was 16. And I think the biggest thing about being a teen, uh, being a pregnant teenager back then, was that people didn't give you information. It was people not really treating you like a whole person. And so, um, I remember my dad, my family coming to the hospital when I was still in the, uh, when I was still dilating or the preterm labor. Um, I remember my dad coming in and my dad is the, the funny one. He is the good cop and the bad cop relationship with my parents. He's the good cop. Um, I just remember him coming in and smiling and just being who he is. And he came in, he was singing six minutes Six minutes, six minutes, Dougie Fresh, you're on, uh, uh, uh. So, of course, that made me laugh. It made me feel better. And it made me feel seen. Um, so I go into this sterile room, sterile cold room, I remember it. Um, and I give birth. alone.
pushing alone. Um, not a child, not a woman. The awkward in betweenness um, and the rushing reality that this is really happening. It's really happening. I'm having a baby. <laughs> Um, I, I don't remember the nurses being kind or anything like that. It was kind of like a regimented process. And a couple hours later, I had a seven pound, 14 ounce baby girl and she was beautiful, green eyes and all. <laughs> um, I don't know who came to see me at the hospital. Uh, the crazy thing is that the, the, there's just like, I'll have a memory and it's kind of like a flashback. I was like, oh, that happened. Oh, that part happened. Um, and even as I'm sitting here, parts of the story just kind of keep jumping and unfolding. And to back up a bit, I remember, um, I don't know if it was my mom, my sisters, they threw me a baby shower. And of course, I'm 16, so I have 16-year-old friends. So I invited some of my 16-year-old friends and my cousins to a baby shower. <laughs> and nobody came. <laughs> Nobody came, but I understand. Who lets their 16-year-old daughter go to a baby shower? <laughs> uh, but I did have everything I needed regardless. Um, so now when I see these memes <laughs> about these out-of-wedlock baby shower meatballs, it's funny because that was me. <laughs> oh, gosh. We had a lot of food left over. Guess nobody came. Glad I can laugh about it a bit now, but it seems like a bit maybe insane to have a baby shower for a 16 year old. I don't know. Do we not celebrate? I had a, a, a best friend in high school. Her name was Tammy. We're like family. It was more than a best friend. And a lot of my daughter's life, her early life, being a baby on, uh, were spent in her house. Her, her grandmother and her mom were um, the primary caregivers, babysitters, when I went to school. Because I did go right back to school. I went right back to school. She was born on January 14th, and that may have been like the MLK break or whatever, but I, I don't remember staying home long. I, I like, went right back to school. Um, I didn't have to make up any uh, time at school. I graduated on time. And I think that, um, I think just my ability to keep going, to keep pressing, I think that's what caused me to suppress so many emotions because I don't know, I've, I don't know if I put the pressure on myself to perform. Um, I certainly know that quitting was never an option. I would graduate high school. Um, I would, I mean, that's who I was. Um, having a kid in high school was just a thing that happened at that time. Um, but again, I didn't realize the effect. I didn't realize the trauma. I didn't realize the emotions and all of the things that um, just got kind of cleverly packed away. They were cleverly packed away. Um, and now when we're talking, when I hear people talk about shame, I can, I, I can recognize it, I can identify it with, because shame manifests in so many different ways. Um, just crazy things like when, when people, when I got older, and I know my story seems like it's jumping around, but. Okay, <laughs> when I got older and people would, would um, find out that I had a kid and 
this is crazy. This is how, again, how shame and how baggage and just my isms, the stuff I had that would just, that people never knew, they never knew. They would go, oh, you have, a, I would say I have a daughter. And they go, oh, well, how old is she? And I'll go, 12. And then they'll look at me and they'll go, how? And then I'm thinking immediately. They're thinking in their head, they're doing the math, they're doing the math. And every time I encountered somebody and had to, and told them, you know, hey, I have a daughter and I would give her age, they would ask her, oh, how old is she? And then they would kind of give me this look and they would, oh, some people would say, oh, you look really young. Or, and I'm thinking, everybody is doing the math on me. They're counting and they're going, and I'm, I'm going to be exposed. They're going to know I had a baby when I was 16. And, and you know, some people, when they ask um, her age and then they ask my age, I would just say, oh, I started young. And that became my line. Oh, I started young. And that was just a process of continuously, continuously disowning that time in my life. I continue to disown it. It was the little things. It was the little things that would trigger me. Somebody would ask her age. I was always thinking what people thought, but no one ever knew that. <laughs> if they knew I had a baby when I was 16, what would they think? Would they think I was promiscuous? Would they think I was easy? Would they think I was less than a person? Um, and then there was, you know, the whole dating thing. It's like when guys knew you had a, a kid, it's like, oh, well, we know she's not a virgin. Mm. And so I was battling that, you know, just internal struggles, internal things that only made sense to me. Uh, creating monsters probably that didn't even exist. <sighs> probably, they probably didn't even exist. But that was, um, yeah. That was how I lived a lot of my life. And in un unpacking some things and just owning that I lived my life for so many years in survival mode. Survival. Okay, I gotta, I gotta have this baby. I gotta get back to school. I gotta graduate. I gotta go to college. I gotta finish college. Um, just the, the, the timer, the, the, the clock just kept rolling. It just kept ticking. And I never allowed it for a pause. I, I never gave myself grace to just pause and say, hey, you went through a heck of a lot and you did a lot and you, you experienced a lot. How does that make you feel? And so that's what I've been doing since August, figuring out how I feel and figuring out how that has guided uh, my relationships, even my relationship with my husband and being in survivor mode. And that affects how you love people. Um, having to be 16, uh, a mom, and growing up with your daughter and having to play the role of an adult when I, re I wasn't an adult. <laughs> um, my daughter's like, you were very hard on me. You were very strict and all of these other things. And it was because I was like literally trying to be a mom. And I thought that's what moms did. <laughs> and I only had one speed <laughs> and that was high. <laughs> I literally only had one speed. And I, I just remember having a moment where I just, where I broke down and I, I thought to myself that out of all the things that I gave my kids, I never gave them a soft mom. 
You know, you have these moms that's like, oh my God, Miss, whatever her name is, so sweet. And they're just so, they're like really sweet moms. And I was, I was always the hard mom. A good mom, but a hard mom. Kind of abrasive. Not at all like uh, Beaver and Wally's mom. <laughs> Uh, or Mrs. Brady, or all of those people we saw on TV, the soft moms. And I believe my experience um, kind of shaped me into uh, not being the soft mom. And I literally had to apologize to my daughter for some of the things, um, some of my ways. I had to apologize to, to my husband for um, just not sharing my softer side because I was always um, defending my worth, I think. That's a new one. I just discovered that. <laughs> Felt like I was defending um, trying to show some people another side of, of who I was. I wasn't just um, a pregnant girl in high school. Um, I was more. I need to take a break. Okay. High school was different because, um, you know, you had the, the period where before I was pregnant and then the time after. So it went from, okay, I'm pregnant, you can visibly see it, to people knowing mm, you had a baby. And I, I'll never forget, um, there were like things, like normal high school things, like homecoming queen and um, student class, whatever. I just wouldn't even, I wouldn't even try because I'm like, I have a baby, they won't vote for me. People won't vote for me. They won't let that happen. And it was something, uh, somebody nominated me for something in uh, high school. It was Miss Something. I don't remember what it was, but I actually won. <laughs> I actually won. <laughs> Um, and wherever the event was, I wasn't even there because I didn't think I would win. <sighs> so it was the dealing with um, the, the post-pregnancy, uh, that part of me that now is the teenager with a child. Yeah. But it's different. It was, it was different in, you know, in ways that, okay, we have this beautiful baby now. She's cute. Everybody loves her. Um, but I'm still dealing with the, the emotional baggage of what are people saying about me. And it was these wars in my head all the time. It was, this, it was a constant thing going in my head. Um, it, it was, uh, it was there when I dated, when I, when I met guys. It was, it was always this thing um, that I was dealing with. 
and I never, um, I don't know what, at what point I freed myself from that. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it was that day in August in my car when I, I owned my shame. Maybe it was that day. Maybe it's today. I don't know. I do know that I, I don't feel like I felt. Um, I do know that it's still a process. Uh, I'm reconciling some things within me, um, things that have shaped me in good ways and bad ways. Um, knowing that therapy is okay. <laughs> and owning um, the missteps or the mess that I've made in some areas of my life that are directly related to me not addressing or even identifying trauma. My, uh, my mother did share some of her story, which really, really helped me um, understand some of her actions some of her emotions, some of her feelings. Um, her story was, again, very much so like mine. Um, the unfair treatment from her, her mom and her family. <sighs> and the, res the, the effects of that, the residual of that is that we never really had a relationship with my maternal grandmother. I don't have any beautiful stories about my grandma. Um, my grandmother is still alive. Um, I, I remember we had to live with her for a short period of time. Um, but even in that <laughs> short space of time, it wasn't, and we were older, we were, we were much older. Um, we had actually just moved back to Savannah from Charleston, so we lived with, our, with my grandma for just a short period of time. But, we never, we never had a relationship, and the effects of the damage that the relationship with my mom and her mom um, has led to a void in my life um, with not, not having that relationship. And who doesn't love a, their grandma? I mean, I certainly love and care for her, but I have no relationship with her. I have no point of reference with my grandmother, um, no specialness. Um, And that's unfortunate. Um, I, wish it wasn't, I wish it wasn't this way. Um, and so, because of the dynamics of their family and the brokenness there, um, it spilled over to brokenness in the relationship with, with her or the lack thereof of relationship with my grandma. Um, Yikes. I don't even know when was the last time I spoke with my grandmother. And maybe, just maybe, um, this is, will lead me to put forth some effort. Um, put forth that effort, but um, it was, there was never an established relationship. Um, my mom didn't, I mean, it just wasn't a thing. Very unfortunate. And so now that I'm a grandma, <laughs> um, I, I cannot imagine me not having relationships uh, and being very present in the lives of my grandkids. Um, I, I can't even imagine that. And so trauma does more than harm you. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a single act. It's not a single thing. It has a ripple effect. And I kept saying, I'm not sure what I want to do with this information, how I want to unpack it. But my prayer, my desire is that if you're watching this, um, that there is a window for reconciliation. There's a time and a space for reconciliation. 
um, with your mom or your siblings or your grandmother. Um, yeah. So I have three beautiful grandsons, all boys. Um, I just was not in that line for girls. God just it's like, I'm sending all boys to her. Um, but they're awesome baby boys, beautiful boys. Avery, Arlo, and Ace. And I'm their lolly. And I could not imagine my life without them. I couldn't imagine my life without my daughter in it. Just going back to that very critical day when I made the decision that I wasn't going to have an abortion. And if you're watching this and that, that has been your decision, then I pray that you're healed. Um, I pray that that was the best decision for your life and for your family and for your outcome. But it just wasn't for me. And I get to share in the life of one of the most beautiful and blessed people that God ever created in the form of my daughter and her teaching me so many things about who I am and just how blessed I am to be her mom and to share in her life and to see how she has grown and to watch our relationship come full circle um, to where we're friends. Um, and I couldn't be more, I couldn't be more happy about the decision that I made that day. It may not have been easy. Um, every day may not have been awesome and amazing, but uh, God has been good. Uh, he, he did me a solid, and um, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a much better place. <laughs> I'm in a much better place now that I've uh, come to terms with, with how I feel and what I dealt with and um, being able to share my story with my mom and how I felt and for her to tell me, you know, I know putting you in that position, I see now and, I'm, and for her to apologize, to say, I'm sorry that I put you in that position. I know that that wasn't the best thing now. Um, and I'm so happy that you didn't. <laughs> we just had this conversation last year in my kitchen. Um, yeah. I think moms need to uh, realize that our moms did the best that they can. Daughters need to realize that our moms did the best that they can a lot of the time. Um, and I understand where my mom was coming from. I understand that she was reacting at a source of pain in her own, uh, in her own life, and it's okay. It's okay. And so I wanna walk away a better mom. I wanna walk away a better daughter. I wanna walk away a better friend. Nobody has to live with shame. You don't have to live with it. So I wanted to share my story, share my experience of unpacking my shame. And I pray that it's a blessing to you because you don't, you don't have to live with shame. I made my load lighter and I hope that I made yours lighter. Thank you for watching.